Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada, and we are all glad that you are here. For this evening's live event, we are exploring anti-racist authors of faith, and we have three, four, three speakers, and we will be um, moderated by Rebecca, so we have a great evening ahead of us. Today we'll be hearing from Alf Dumont, who will share reflections about the other side of the river from Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. We'll hear from Andrew Kunoti Larenge, who will speak about uh, reflections on emancipation and anti-Black racism for Canada. Ano Wang Kwong, who will reflect on Jesus and the marginalized, Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. And this whole gathering will be moderated by Rebecca Hornberg, who's the manager of the United Church Bookstore. Before we move into the panel, just a little bit of background about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism in case you are here for the first time. So this live event is part of a 40 day program that has uh, daily written reflections each day with the exception of Sundays. And each day's reflection offers opportunities for learning, faith reflection and ideas for action. And all of the writings were written by people who represent the breadth and diversity of the United Church and from a wide range of backgrounds and identities. And these reflections are all posted on the United Church website one week at a time. In addition to these live events, the, the daily reflections are these live events and they're running every Tuesday and being recorded so they can be viewed at any time. Today, we are featuring authors who have written in United Church books and all of the books we are talking about today are available from the United Church bookstore. And all of the books are available at a discounted price. Um, mm -hmm. If you use the code 40 days, you can receive a discount of 20% off orders of two or more books up until November 30th. So if you go to the website, ucrdstore.ca and use the discount code 40 days, 20% um, off, which is great. Uh, in addition to the live events and the daily reflection, there's a weekly newsletter that you can sign up to to keep up to date with all that's happening. And then there's a couple more live events for the Tuesdays that are remaining in the rest of this month. So now over to our panels and our featured speakers, Alf, Andrew, Owong, and Rebecca. So please allow me to introduce them and then I will hand it all over to Rebecca to moderate this gathering. So Alf Dumont, Alf on, uses he, him pronouns, and Alf honors the traditional teachings of his Indigenous spirituality. He served in the United Church of Canada for 40 years as a minister in several churches, as the director of the Jesse Soto Resource Center, an Indigenous theological, an Indigenous theological center, and as speaker or the executive secretary of the All Native Circle Conference, an Indigenous conference in, in the United Church of Canada. Alf walks the two worlds of Indigenous and settler. He shares his story, seeking to build bridges between these worlds. Alf challenges the church to re-examine the theology be behind its past decisions around residential schools so that it might live out the words of its apologies. And he challenges the people of Canada, the government of Canada, and the institutions of Canada to re-examine their responsibilities and relationships with Indigenous people. He does this through his writings, through presentations, and through encouraging all people to tell their stories as they share in talking circles. Owan Kwong uses he, him pronouns. And Owan was born and raised in South Korea, ordained in the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea. And he is the first minister from the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea who entered ministry in the United Church of Canada under the mutual recognition of ministries between the two churches. Since 2017, he has been dynamically involved in ministries in Chinook Winds region. He also received his PhD in religion from Claremont Graduate University in 2008. Since then, he has been seeking to figure out how to live out faith on earth as he showed his enthusiasm for intercultural ministry by co-authoring Jesus and the Marginalized together with Dr. Donald Schweitzer. Owong is very interested in discovering powerful theological lessons in the dialogue between traditional and progressive theologies in pursuit of love, justice, and peace. Andrew Kunoti Larenge uses he, him pronouns and is a minister 
in Chalmers West Wesley United Church in Quebec City. He has a Bachelor of Divinity degree from St. Paul's University, Lumuru, Kenya, Kenya, and a Master's of Theological Studies from Jew University in New Jersey. He is a PhD student in New Testament and Early Christianity in McGill University in Montreal. He was ordained in the Methodist Church in Kenya before coming into the United Church of Canada. So welcome to Alf, Owang, and Andrew. And this gathering will be moderated by Rebecca Hornberg. Rebecca Hornberg uses she, her pronouns. And Rebecca is the manager of the United Church Bookstore. Eager to learn and curious at heart, Rebecca is an avid reader and particularly enjoys audiobooks, which allow her to fold laundry, go for a run, or prep a family meal, while also gaining new insights and perspectives. Rebecca has over 15 years of experience in business development, leadership, and processes of change. And Rebecca is originally from Stockholm, Sweden, and has worked and or studied in Paris, Geneva, Kuala Lumpur, and Jerusalem. Today, Toronto is home. Welcome to Rebecca, welcome to everyone, and thank you all for being here. Well, thank you for uh, reading those lovely bios, and I'm certainly excited about this evening's conversation with Alf and Wong and Andrew. And one of my first questions to the three of you is like, well, we've heard these biographies. What is something that you can share with tonight's and this evening's audience that would get them to know you a little bit better. And Owang, would you like to, to start? Oh, myself? Mm -hmm. More? Okay. Something little that you <laughs> think if you share this, people will understand you a little bit better. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Owang Gwan and I'm now serving uh, the United Churches as Stetter, Erskine, and Big Belly in Chinook Winds region. And uh, I mean, you talk about uh, just my uh, ministry background. And actually, uh, I studied in the US. There, my major was uh, theology, ethics, and culture. But uh, I actually, in South Korea, I taught, uh, as, I mean, students on, in two undergraduate schools. And, one, two graduate seminary, I mean, uh, some many courses concerning the social justice and democracy and social, uh, Christian social movement thing. And still I'm interested in gaining theological lessons from traditional theologies while I'm so much interested in the contemporary theological works. And I'm so glad and happy that I'm invited to make some presentation of the book, uh, Jesus and the Marginalized. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you, Wuwan. Andrew, uh, would you want to share something about yourself that you think that afterwards the group will know you a little bit better? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, really, I, I'm thinking what, I, what will make you want to get, get to know me better. I'm really a minister at heart. Um, that's something that I, I take very dearly because uh, it's the thing that actually got me into this trajectory of anti-racism. Uh, the truth is when I joined ministry in Kenya, it was not part of the agenda. It's a, it is complete, it was something where I, I knew racism is bad because I grew up uh, uh, just a few years after Kenya got independence. But by the time I was joining ministry, that, that memory had started kind of cooling down and nobody really, young people like me did not take that on as, a, as something you'd want to do in life. I had a grandpa who is brother to my, grand, my real grandfather who fought in uh, Kenya independent movement uh, called Mau Mau. And uh, he was shot on his knee so we kind of, younger people kind of associated him with the liberation movement of the past. So it didn't mean a lot to me then, but our ministry 
is one that when I joined ministry in trade in Kenya, I'll actually talk a little bit about that in my book, in the, in the little the book I'm talking about, my article. Uh, I joined just to be a minister, it's simple, just preach the love of God, preach Christ. That's what got me into, into this. But uh, of course, it led me to the United States and Canada, where things uh, took a different turn that are now anti-racism is kind of becoming part of what I do often than I thought. Uh, so really, I think that's one thing that uh, I would say would define me in ministry. Mm-hmm. And uh, then anti-racism is part of what I do as ministry. Yes, it's key, but it's part of many other things that I do as a minister. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Andrew. And uh, now over to you, Al. Alfred Amos Dumont, Indigenous, Badaban Megizi Anish Niwint, Wawashishi and Dodum, Shanaga and Dujnaba, Quitlam and Dea Nungum, BCIT, Ichi Aya. My name is Alfred Amos Dumont. Each name means something. Elf means counselor. Amos means bearer of burdens. Dumont means from the mountains, where I came from, where my family came from at one stage. Dab and Megizi are the indigenous names that I was given, the Anishinaabe names. It means break of day and eagle. Break of day means learning new things. Eagle means flying high and getting the best perspective you can on life around you. I am part of the Martin clan. Indigenous people, when they were pulled away from their communities, lost who they were. Martin clan is one who welcomes them back into their community and says, you are who you are. It was only this year that I, or two years ago that I received my status and my sons have their status. It took that long because my grandmother and my mother married off the reserve and they lost their status. I was raised in the Shanaga territory. I now live in Kwikwetlam territory. We keep acknowledging the land where we are and how it had responsibility from the people of the land to care for that land. So I acknowledge that I tried to care for the land in Shanaga and I care for the land in Kwikwetlam where I live. I work at British Columbia Institute of Technology as an elder. When I retired, they asked me if I would become one of their elders. And so I act as an elder there. I was raised, uh, as my book says, on the other side of the river. Shanaga River on the south side was where the reserve was. On the north side is where my family grew up. So when I looked onto the other side, I said, there's part of me who was over there. I am part Anishinaabe, part French, part English, and part Irish. As my analyst once said to me, you have three nations fighting one inside you. And though that's been part of my struggle of identity all my life, trying to find out who I am and own who I am and walk with other people to get them to share their stories so that we can find healing together. Jamie Gwetch for listening. And I'll end with these words, which we usually do this as a welcome. Bojo, Ani Bojo, are you the one lowered from the creator? That's how we see everyone we meet. Thank you so much, Alfred, and for uh, to all of you for sharing something about yourself. And I certainly feel that I know you a little bit better. I also know that the three of you are authors and you've been writing books and writing a book is a, is a personal experience for the author. And when the day comes and you release your book, all of a sudden it's out there for everyone to read. <laughs> Um, I want to poll this group quickly, and uh, I'm sure you all know how to raise your hand um, virtually, if you will, the the little reactions button. Uh, How many of you have read anything by any of these three authors? So if you read anything of them, please raise your hand. Wow. There's a lot of raised hands here. That's wonderful to see. I'm 
in a group with people that have uh, read something. And there's also a lot of people that have yet to explore your work and um, take part of your stories through, through your books. So if in one or perhaps two sentences, would you like to describe why should anyone read your book? Why did you write it and why should someone read it? And uh, Andrew, I was hoping that you would like to answer that question first. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much. So this is the book that I'm talking about. It's actually a very small book in size because uh, it's what I call a coincidental publishing. It was not supposed really to be published. Uh, this book came as an idea from uh, the church in Alberta where Paul Douglas Wolfo is the minister. And they suggested that there were some articles we started, uh, I think three or so years ago, blogs actually, blogs about anti-racism. And um, we, they were kind of began like anti-racism blogs. So, and uh, say so this church said, why can't we publish this? And uh, they ended up publishing it. And uh, it was really to coincide with, with last year's the first day of emancipation after the, 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 the House of Commons agreed that we actually going to make August 1st uh, Emancipation Day in Canada. And that was kind of in that way, it was uh, kind of an inaugural book for emancipation in Canada. So if you want something that can give you a very brief uh, summary of why we celebrate emancipation in Canada, here is a book for you. Uh, it gives you, uh, I would really uh, talk about the others. Yeah, I'm not the only, I'm the only author. There, there are uh, 13 articles from 13 authors, um, both black and not, not black. So Richard Bott, Jordan Canto, Gary Patterson, Rob, Rob Fanel, uh, Bob Filia, I, Renato Walcott, a very brilliant scholar actually. If you, I would encourage you to read more about from Renato Walcott on, on anti-racism in this country. Anton Red, also another brilliant scholar. Steve, uh, Steve Davidson, another one. Althea uh, Spencer Miller. She is teaching in Drew University where I was, but she came after, after I left, but I have been following her. My, uh, and then there is Mickey Roberts, Oro Thomas, and Paul Douglas Wolfo, who has been very involved in this, in this, in this endeavor uh, in our um, anti-racism. So the book is called Reflections on Emancipation and Anti-Racism in Canada. You can find it there. Very easy to, you can also do it as a kind of a Bible study. It's set in such a way that it's a discursive book. There are reflections, there are questions to answer after you read it. And you can use it for groups, and uh, it'll it'll be a perfect thing. If you think about next year, Black History Month, there is a book for you. If you think about August uh, uh, Emancipation, there is a book for you, or even for any other season, really. Perfect book for that. Very easy to read, not long. Thank you. I noticed that Pat raised your hand. If you have a questions, we're going to try to keep them to the end, but please also feel free to write them in the chat and I will make sure to monitor the, the chat function, function as well. So in uh, one or two sentences, uh, Wang, uh, why uh, did you write the book <clears throat> and why should someone read it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Actually, sure I that's was a very easy question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was invited to the Dan Schweitzer's project. Uh, actually, we Korean groups uh, host uh, every two years the Intercultural Adventure Seminar. And uh, for fourth seminar, I was invited to uh, be the, the, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Don Schweitzer for his project. And we worked together uh, for this book, Jesus and the Marginalized, right? And finally, the title is Jesus and the Marginalized. It has a Korean translation, too, right? And uh, this book deals with how Koreans in the United Church understand Jesus Christ in marginalized situations. And I mean, lots of racialized people are 
living together in Canada. And we are just you know, paying attention to Korean situations. And many Koreans in the United Church experience a marginality and liminality and diversity in Canada. And just, you know, they are very passionate in struggling with their life in a marginalized situations, which is very challenging to them. And to Korean Christians, it's very surprising that, uh, I mean, there is a diversity in understanding Jesus Christ in the United Church of Canada. In this situation, uh, the uh, Koreans in the United Church of Canada need to learn how to understand Jesus Christ from their perspectives, well, which would be made in their marginalized situation. So uh, this is more like a contextual theology and uh, it deals with the Korean situation as uh, more like, uh, as I mentioned, you know, marginalized situation and also, uh, well, the book that explore the possibility of uh, just enabling the Koreans, I would say the all marginalized people in Canada uh, to understand uh, Jesus Christ in their situation mm. with their capability, fragility, and marginality, I mean, which may inspire Koreans uh, to find their callings in Jesus' uh, threefold office, which is Cal John Calvin's idea, right? That is prophet, king, and pre, uh, priest, and well, which may motivate them to carry out their missions that Jesus fulfilled as prophet, king, and uh, priest. So, well, it is quite exciting and interesting to both of us, I mean, Dr. Don Shuai and me, that, mm. uh, well, kept, I mean, marginalized situation, I mean, experiencing marginalized, margin, marginality, in one's life would be definitely the bad one, though, right, though, mm. it is in that kind of liminal, liminal and marginalized situation where uh, people uh, could uh, see and encounter the presence of Jesus Christ and interpret Jesus Christ in their own perspective and in their own terms, uh, which is quite exciting to me too. Mm. And uh, personally, well, my just role was, I mean, in co-authoring the book, that I was making many comments uh, from the Korean theologian. And uh, I also talk about uh, the role of white members in the United States of Canada mm. for this understanding, because uh, overcoming racism uh, can be uh, realized just only when we, we all who are involved in this issue are in cooperation with each other for the mm -hmm. same goal, right? So uh, I just many times I talk about it with uh, Dr. Don Shai and just in you know, the we work together for this idea, and I think that this book attempts to give an answer to the question: Who is Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church today? But uh, in my sense, this book may be applicable to all who are interested in understanding Jesus Christ in their own situation. Yes. Well, I mm. hope and I hope my, my expectation is that this book will be applicable to uh, like a, a many racialized groups, right? Yeah, and it also uh, just maintains the more like a theological tension between the catholicity of Jesus, I mean, understanding Jesus Christ and the contextuality of Jesus Christ, understanding Jesus Christ. So uh, I believe that this book may be a good guide to those who are interested in this topic. And more like, a, well, I hope that this book can be a good guide to overcoming a conventional understanding of Jesus Christ functioning mm. as a textbook to both other racialized peoples and white members who are interested in this topic. So Thank you. Yeah, that's what I want to share. Yeah. Yes, uh, one, we have a clarifying question whether your book is based on uh, Min Young Liberation Theology asks. Uh, Min Jung Theology? Uh, Min Young Liberation Theology. Oh, uh, we say that it is Min Jung Theology though, right? Yeah. Okay. You call it is Korean theology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is uh, quite, uh, I mean, 
this book has uh, some implications for that. I mean, though uh, this book is not necessarily, you know, uh, addressing the Minjung theology as an alternative. Uh, but, you know, it, definitely Minjung theology is a very important uh, theological access to those who are interested in this kind of theological works. Thank definitely. you. Yeah, yeah. Alfred, over to you. One or two sentences about. This is uh, my book, The Other Side of the River. From Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. I was asked to tell my story by many people in the church. I am basically an introvert and I had difficulty doing that, but because people asked me to write my story because I was a human being who walked through life following the church teachings. My brother and I both went into theology and studied ministry, but Jim uh, decided to follow the Mendewi Win way, the traditional way of our people. And we agreed to honor each other's journey. So the writing of the book has to do with identity as we, as individual indigenous people are trying to struggle to find out who we are because the government of Canada, when it was formed, tried to make us leave our indigenous understandings and ways and only follow church ways. So th this book is one that says we can learn from each other. We can value the teachings that come from traditional way and we can honor those teachings as well as following the church teachings that we have or the teachings on Jesus. And a simple example of that is that we have six teachings in the Medewiwin way, love, courage, respect, humility, honor, truth, and wisdom, or honesty, truth, and wisdom. There's a teaching underneath that that says, you can't have one without the other. You cannot have love without courage. You cannot have honesty without having humility. You can't have any of those. You can't have wisdom without having love. You can't have any of those teachings without honoring and recognizing the work together. I took that underlying teaching and tied it to the four teachings on love and Christianity that have come to us. Love God, love our enemy, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. And I said to myself, I can't have one without the other. I cannot love God without loving myself. I cannot love myself without loving God. I cannot love myself unless I love my neighbor. And I really can't love myself if I can't love my enemy. So those teachings that are there in deep spiritual ways that we have within our many cultures and many teachings that we give can inform us and make us look at our spiritual journeys in a different way. Coming from those four different cultures and nations inside myself, this book and the way I wrote it helped me to begin to own my own identity and see my spirituality as part of that journey. But I think that is a story that's common for so many people. We are wrestling with who we are. We carry more than one culture and one teaching inside us. We carry more than one spirituality, even if we don't admit it. And we need to honor those because the spirit is speaking to us. How can we be leaders in this time and in this way? How can we walk well together? So this book is one that shares my story. And if you like weird humor, it's in there. And you can laugh because laughter is a part of the indigenous way of finding the healing that we need. So I invite people to read it if they want. I invite people to laugh if they want. Oh. Thank you. Um, and certainly life changes and the world around us changes too. And uh, you three have three different perspectives and you've been writing three distinctly in one way, different books as well, or portions of books as Andrew pointed out. Um, however, the work of anti-racism is always ongoing. And I'm really curious to learn more about what does your work look like today uh, on anti-racism and what are some of those key points that you believe is um, really important to emphasize? 
And uh, Wong, if, if you would like to go first, I would uh, really much appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, well, as you see, uh, this theological work has been done in collaboration with uh, Don Schweitzer. And uh, from my standpoint, I wanted to point out uh, the, the role of uh, white majority in the United Church of Canada in overcoming racism and building up an intercultural church. Uh, there have been great uh, European theologians in history, and now their works are under criticism in many ways, but uh, Western churches created their practices and traditions based upon their theological works. And we are standing on this ground, though we may criticize them from different angles, they may need to understand marginality, diversity, and liminality that were like in this book, Korea's experience. And white members might not understand nor experience, but I believe that it should be white members who can be the true and important collaborators with racialized peoples, including Koreans. I mean, racism can be fully overcome in collaboration with all. And in addition, uh, this book emphasizes the importance of continuous conversation between white majority and racialized groups in understanding Jesus. I mean, for example, uh, the gospel is inculturated in every cultural context while it is becoming Catholic, universally present throughout the world. So why we need to understand Jesus from diverse cultural, racial, ethnic, and social perspectives we also need to understand Jesus at the level of the United Church as a whole, which is as we call a centric papal approach. Of uh, both centrifugal fugo and centric papal approaches need to uh, keep with each other in dialogue. So, in this dynamic conversation between two groups, the United Church of Canada uh, may be able to become a truly intercultural in the sense of Catholicity. So just, I hope that uh, this will be an inspiration to all who are interested in this kind of issue. I'm doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Another question, what do you have in your mug, Wang? This one? Yeah. Just water. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, Alfred, you had also a mug, I believe. Uh, Wong and I are on the same page. This, this is a mug for water, hot water. <laughs> hot water, yeah. I, I have some nettle tea in mine. Andrew, I haven't seen if you're drinking something, but... Uh, you, yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that some of the participants are ever so often bringing like a mug to our, our lips and yes, Adele is having some green one. Uh, and <laughs> um, well, thank you Wang, for, for sharing uh, some of the things that are, are important to you and your anti-racism work right now. And Alfred, I would like to hear from you as well. Like, what are some of the, the hows and some of the pointers on anti-racism work that shapes your daily life and your current work? Well, one of the things that I learned from my elders is that we need to share our stories. And the way we share stories in the indigenous culture is we sit in a circle we have a talking stick and we pass that talking stick around to whoever needs to talk at that stage. They share their story. They are the leader of the circle at that time because there's no head in a circle. And then they pass that talking stick on and then they share their story. I have been working uh, at BCIT with intercultural groups, with students uh, who are both First Nations, Métis and some non-First Nation students. We get them to share their stories, their struggles, to help them find their identity. And when we hear the story of another person who doesn't come from our culture, we learn something about our own culture and our own perspective. 
when I share my story, I let part of myself out. I don't hide it. I try to give what I can. And that's what we do when we share stories. We try to share honestly with each other. If we're going to deal with racism, we have to talk about who we are, where we're coming from, what we bring, how that has formed us. And talking in the circle, how does that inform us and change us? Because we've heard the stories of other people from other cultures. And we want to honor those stories out of love and respect. And so part of my understanding of how we deal with racism is we share our stories in the circle of life. And I'm not the only one who speaks of this. This man here, Chief Bobby Joseph, wrote this book. And that means all my relations. It means we're all related. We all have a story. We all need to share. Racism doesn't go away easily. But what we can do within the churches and in religious organizations is to sit down intentionally and talk to people and share what we have and be vulnerable and be open to change. So that's what I do at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. That's what I do with some of the churches in and around this area when they ask. And that's what I do on some of the national meetings when I'm asked to be involved in there is we try to share who we are and our stories. Simple as that. And hard as that, right? Right, it's hard. <laughs> Andrew, uh, how would you describe your current work on anti-racism? And, and I think like all of us, we, we know how important this is, but that's why we want to learn and uh, hear of some of your house. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm really appreciative of what uh, our friend and uh, Hogwang are, are saying and what they are doing. Because it's, it's, a, it's a united front, if I would use that terminology. We have to do this one together. And uh, I, I'm going to borrow the, the one that we got the other day from Desmond, uh, core conspirators. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're in whichever side, so we conspire together to fight against uh, this uh, enemy we call racism. So one of the things that I do is writing about it. Mm. I come from a culture that actually is not a writing culture. In Africa, majority, I would say majority, not all of it, because I'll be lying to say I, I represent the entire continent. But majority of, especially what we call tropical Africa, what others call sub-Saharan Africa, we are oral people, oral tradition. And, uh, but uh, that's the, the part that has been hit much by colonialism, and racism that was perpetrated into our continent for 40 years, harvesting people and uh, distributing to all of them all over the world. And uh, that orality has been hit so hard. So for me, when I write uh, about ra uh, racist, racism and anti-racism, I'm participating in a way of kind of subversion in a way. Writing is not just writing. Uh, I, I, I use the tools that has been used to suppress, but also I am using them to resurrect the, the mm -hmm. same tools. So I do write, and uh, I don't think I'm doing the way I want, but I'm, I'm using this one very consciously on writing. And also writing books, because there's a difference between writing a book and a tweet, because I think a tweet will die, but a book will stay a little bit longer. So that's what I'm, so that's what I'm doing here intentionally. I, I do, a, I, one of the books that I, I wrote an article in like four or five years ago, 2016. Is this little book here? It's also, mm. it's called uh, the, the Post-Colonial post Church. Church. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Post-Colonial Church, Bible Theology and Mission. It's uh, edited by some of my um, seniors in, from Kenya, um, I, including one of my uh, academic dean when I was in school. And uh, basically, the, the, these are the articles in that article, I'm actually reading um, the, the book of Paul, the uh, letter of Paul to Galatians on what I'm calling mimicry, how the empire works. I'm trying to kind of problematize some of the things that we have been translating in the Bible, in the, especially the letters to Paul. So writing about it is one of the way I do it. Another thing is researching. Um, I am 
as I said during my, um, actually I don't read this one, during my intro, I do research. I'm doing a PhD in uh, early Christianity. I'm a New Testament, new early Christianity scholar. Right now I'm researching on what I'm calling slaves and slavery in the early Christian, Christian martyrdom literature. And I hope that one I will finish it in my PhD. Again, a kind of trying to understand the whole concept of slavery. Mm. And the Roman slavery had a lot to give to the, to, to, the, to the slavery that was so much detrimental to my people. So, so I'm really reading that one with a lot of keenness and interest and the idea of suffering. Yeah, Because one of the things that the enslavement did is, is kind of making suffering part of the system. Mm. One of the uh, others of slavery, uh, uh, Orlando Patterson has said something that has stuck with me. In all forms of enslavement, from ancient to modern, the whip, to whip people, to beat people, was common. So suffering became a form of, 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 of making people normalize the abnormal. Mm. So that's one. So that's some of the thing I'm doing. So researching, I do other things. Um, uh, Brian, Michel, Michel Walker, we know this. We do anti uh, so, uh, racial justice workshop. Uh, that's part of what I do as a minister, and I, that one actually I do as part of my daily ministry in the church. I preach in the pulpit, and uh, I, I also participate in some boards in our church. Like I'm in admissions. I mean, in board of vocation. But I'm very interested on admissions because that is another place I've realized that racism is rearing its hand in our beloved United Church of Canada. And we have to beat it. Thank you so much, Andrew. And kind of hoping that for like this group, we're 58 people present and that we all take some time to reflect what we are doing. What does our current work look like in anti-racism? And while you're reflecting on that, and perhaps you want to share in the chat, um, I want to read something that someone sent to me. Gary uh, writes, I recall hearing once that Jesus himself taught like a First Nation elder, not with a theological lecture, but by telling stories. God is like a father who has two sons. Period. And um, thank you so much for sharing that reflection with the group. Uh, Gary. And on that note, I was hoping that the group would want to reflect, well, the authors, in your own words on how anti-racism connect to faith. And what may be some of those perhaps scriptures or images that you would name as part of this. And uh, Andrew, perhaps you would like to go first. So, uh, uh, yes, how, how is anti-racism connected to faith? Uh, it's very much connected, really. Um, uh, first of all, I'll begin by mentioning it outrightly that uh, racism is, is, is uh, I would probably become more blatant and say it's anti-God, if I would say that. Uh, beginning from the story we read from Genesis, is that God created, yeah, each one of us in God's image. So racism becomes a stain to that God's image. So by staining the creation of God, by staining my skin, saying it's not good, it's it's what only for slavery. Then you are becoming anti-God, mm. what we call sin. So, so in that way, it, it's challenging faith. So for me, uh, doing anti-racist work is actually doing what our minister is supposed to do, bringing the message of God to people, bringing the, the hope that we are all created in God's image. And uh, uh, Psalm says it very well, 139, uh, um, 13 to 14, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, all of us, that's all of us. So, so that's something else. I, I also do New Testament. That's actually my specialization. And Paul has this very interesting statement that are, as, as, has been named by New Testament, Testament scholars as baptism or credo. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that, that in Christ Jesus, 
we are all the same. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. There is neither slave. And I like that statement because yes. that has been <laughs> Noah free. So we are all the same in Christ. We are baptized. So, so for me, uh, faith uh, and, and anti-racism is part of really, uh, it's because the gospel. Like, mm-hmm. Really, I, I preach that as a gospel, that Christ is here to restore humanity. So uh, uh, really, that's what I would say. Uh, there are many others I, I could use, for example, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch who says, hey, I'm reading this, and after he understands this, he says, what can resist me from being baptized right now? And of course, uh, uh, Philip goes ahead and baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch in the Acts of Apostles. So, so and, and this story is important because I know, I know it's, it's very important for the, uh, the LGBTQ 2 plus S uh, community. But for me, it's close to my heart because my father preached, not actually preached, he mentioned it when I was a kid. He said that uh, the Ethiopian eunuch um, got baptized and uh, I'm from Kenya on the northern part is Ethiopia. So like, oh, there is a black guy in the Bible? Just right on the north of our country. <laughs> it was kind of a kind of a really really revelatory. Uh, so really, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So for me, um, anti-racism work is an act of faith. It's recreating what God created, removing the stains. Is is kind of trying to bleach a cloth to newness. Thank you, Alfred. Would you like to share next? I'm not sure I'm going to speak strictly from scripture, but in part of my story, my father, when he wanted to get married, my father came from a Catholic background, being the French side. He went to the priest and asked the priest in the Shanaga village if he would marry my mother, Sarah. And the priest looked at him and said, marry someone of your own kind, and your own race. And knowing my father and his temper, he probably told that priest something. (laughs) He went across the street where the Methodist church was, which was just becoming the church. And he said, I would like to get married to Sarah. I know she's First Nations. The minister said, I only have two rules that you continue to talk to each other. And when you have a problem, you'll sit down and try to work it out. Do you think you can do that? And dad said, yes, I think we can. And so did mom. And so they got married. We hold certain things within the church to be the only truth. What I have found out is when we share with each other, When we really hear each other, we see more in scripture than we did see before. So loving our neighbor, loving our family, those are profound teachings deep inside of scripture, but they also ask us to move beyond sometimes what we think to be our neighbor, what we think to be our family and to try to include everybody in that. And in that way, we begin to deal with racism because we say, your story is different from mine, but you're teaching me something. And out of that teaching, I respond out of love. When I was a very young boy, I often got beaten up because I was very small and and very timid. And one time, one of my friends who was on a Shinabi background and grabbed the bat out of my hand, pushed me down, swung the bat, and it hit the top of my nose that I could see only sparks in my eyes. And I was in Alliston as a minister. I got a phone call from Tom. And he said, I want to ask you to forgive me for what I did to you. All those years that I held that anger inside and felt useless in one way was broken by his love enough to call me. And I had to love myself enough to forgive myself for not taking, for 
holding that anger inside. I had to let go of that anger. Mm. And that helped my healing. But it also gave me a teaching on forgiveness. You have to forgive yourself for the anger you hold and the ideas you hold and be open when people come to you and say, I want to love you in a way that I didn't love you before. That to me comes out of the deep part of scripture. And that's what deals with racism. Thank you so much. Uh, Owang, over to you on the topic of faith and anti-racism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as we share, I believe that just we are saved by God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And yeah, God created us all in God's image. So uh, no one can be excluded, discriminated, or, or alienated just because of race or ethnicity. And uh, Peter also said in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 35, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism in every nation. He accepts those who fear him and do what is right. However, it is really difficult to put this idea into practice in our daily life. In Galatians chapter 2, Peter was rebuked by Paul because of Peter's discriminatory act. I mean, Peter stopped eating together with the Gentiles because he was afraid of being criticized by those who argued for the importance of circumcision in salvation. Yeah, but it may happen still in the world now. Uh, but Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Scriptures are clearly against racism and they support anti-racism. That's what I believe. Thank you so much. Um, we have been sharing some of the stories uh, from your lives respectively, but I'm curious and I would love for you to share if there's been a milestone or a turning point in your life that in regards to anti-racism that you would like to share. And uh, Wang, would you like to share first, please? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, recently, uh, my writing on anti-racism was posted on the website of the United Church of Canada. It's one of the 40 days, uh, what is engagement on anti-racism. And in my writing, I talked about my experience in a gathering. So let me read the story, it's short. Uh, one experience at a large United Church of Canada event remains unforgettable. Everything had been going well. At meal times, however, a few of us struggled with feeling isolated. We were three racialized ministers and we were often left by ourselves during meals. It happened, it happened quite consistently that the three of us were left alone together to eat by ourselves. By contrast, the majority of other people at the gathering were white and they gathered in large groups with their friends. We didn't talk too much about this racial dynamic at the time, but we talked about it later. I never believed that the white people at the meeting were intentionally ignoring our presence, but the dynamic bothered us quite a bit. At one point, when I talked with the other ministers about what we were experiencing in relation to the importance of intercultural ministries, they emphasized with me and then agreed that we need to engage in intercultural ministries, right? It's a way of overcoming racism. I believe that they are great United Church ministers still. And just a thought, a tall glass wall, which might be called white supremacy, might prevent us from creating unity. So in that article, my suggestion was that we would create an intercultural community 
by having intercultural meals, which could break racial divides. Yeah, and that's like what that. I want to share today. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. That's a very precise story and a very clear milestone. Since this event, what what happened? What what has been different? Have you decided to act different in the similar settings, or do you feel different uh, once yeah. you sort of saw it happening? Right. I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> it's a but very it, precise, I mean, good example. Okay, thank you. Uh, but this kind of situation may happen even yes. in South Korea. I mean, I mean, suppose that we all gather. Long time friends get each other. Hello, let's have a meal together. But, but like a newcomers may not have their friends to yes. eat together with. I mean, just like that, right? Uh, but I don't believe that uh, they intentionally did it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. They are all good friends to me still. Yeah, just the, it wasn't happening, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, if we make some, I mean, if we just, you know, pay attention to, more attention to just, you know, other racialized people with our true hearts a little bit more, then we have lots of things to do to break down yes. the division, right? Yes. Eating together would be a good tool for them, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Wang. Uh, Alfred, over to you, if you want to share a specific moment or a milestone. My milestone doesn't have to do so much with racism as with inter-spiritual understanding. And maybe that has to do with racism as well. One of those profound moments came when I went into the sweat lodge in the early days of my life, when I was getting back into understanding those teachings that we have that come out of the sweat lodge and the spiritual ways of our people. Everyone left the sweat lodge except me and I was in there for another 20 minutes or so. And the elder who was leading the lodge said, Alf, are you okay? Is there something wrong? And I said, no, I'm talking to the spirit. Mm. I had one of those profound times when the spirit spoke to me. As that spirit spoke to me, sometimes in church services that others were leading. But I was listening to what the spirit was saying. And the spirit was saying, here in this lodge, I can teach you as well. Spirit is not different. We make it different. We define it differently. But the spirit or the creator or God is one through all spiritualities. And we need to walk with respect and understand and learn from that. I learned that day that I could walk out of the lodge and feel good, walk into the church and feel that same presence, profound mm -hmm. presence that was teaching me that I needed to look in a different way. And so I came out of my hands and knees because you can't come out of the lodge except you crawl out of the lodge as you crawl into the lodge. Mm -hmm. Come with you humility. Mm. You learn humility. And that touched my life and it changed me so that I could respect my brother's way and be it my way as well as still embracing church teaching. But I had to look at church teachings in a different way. And I had to look at Jesus in a different way. A spirit in me, the holy one that moved, moved in me in a different way that day. That's the story I wanted to share. What an incredibly profound story, Alfred. And thank you for, for sharing that. I can I can really see that in, in front of me. Uh, you both crawling in, but also completely exhausted, I would imagine, crawling out of that space, but uh, with a new sense of completeness, I guess, is what you were saying. Mm, thank you. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Do you want to share a milestone or an event or a turning point in your life as in regards to anti-racism? 
For, for some reason, that sounds like a very big question for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <'Cause> I, I, <laughs> but perhaps you have like something in yeah, memory yeah. of. Yes, I do. The thing is, I keep having very uh, problem. Like a before and after. The many That's racialized kind of... people who agree with me. You keep remembering very many small memories. You don't mm-hmm. know which one to share. Because one of, one of them is so big today, and then you meet another one tomorrow. Like, oh, this is <laughs> You're like, did I t- talk to you about this thing that happened yesterday? It's nothing. Yes, yes, so, so, yeah. <laughs> Let so, me tell you. I, <clears throat> probably, uh, I'll share a few things. Uh, I'll actually begin my turning point of which is not a turning point that has been happening to me that is surprising me. Mm. Uh, uh, when I left Kenya in 2005 to go and study in the United States, uh, it's the first time in my life that I felt myself in a skin um, because Kenya is, is predominantly a black country. Uh, mm. uh, probably don't even use the word black, we are Africans. So arriving in New Jersey, all of a sudden I felt my skin, something that had not happened um, really for almost 30 years that I'd lived in Kenya before that time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then since then, of course, I went back to Kenya and then uh, I came to Canada. So cumulatively, I had those years of so around 14 and a half years in North America. Mm-hmm. And uh, that has become a very interesting turning point for me so all along it's been a curve it's not like like a turn it's not like real yeah. it's a curve that has been defining my ministry that I find as I, I began I find myself doing more of anti-racist kind of ministry than what I and thought of as a ministry when I was called into ministry so that is a big turning point for me actually I was even surprised when I don't know who came up with calling us anti-racist authors because I never even imagined myself as an anti-racist <laughs> author and I would not have defined myself that so I'm finding myself in this kind of fighting myself they're like oh yeah actually I yeah. am you know I agreed with it but I never when I wrote that article I was not saying I'm an anti-racist author no 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 but all of a sudden this discussion defined me. I'm like, oh yeah, actually I am. <laughs> so, so it's that turn. But of course, there have been very few in, in recent part of my life. Um, the death of John Floyd. It's very known by everybody. It hit me in a very big way. Um, why? Because my son also was turning four years that day, oh. and we were busy celebrating his birthday. And I'm like, four years. And that is his life that I'm setting him to. I'm mm-hmm. setting him to the streets that are not very friendly, the streets, and not only the streets, but also the images that are being shown in this part of the world every day, where a black man will die and it will be filmed and nobody will, will bother about mm-hmm. it. So that kind of became like a defining moment of my ministry to say, I'm going to do this as long as I can, I can live. I'm going to fight against racism because I want my son if things go well, at least to have a better image than what I saw during his fourth birthday. Yeah. So that was kind of a very strong time. But of course, I had other, other experiences. I'm sure. Yeah, including but, my daughter not getting my name that I wanted her to have in Quebec. Right. So two of my children now have different last names because of Quebec's racist, I would call them, of course, I would think it's not, but racist laws that mm-hmm. say, um, as, as much as I'm, I'm trying to explain to them that this is how we name our, our children in my culture, no more to listen. I'm here to go to court to challenge that. It's costly. So I still I have to pay money for racist laws. So and I mean, more. my wife being attacked in a working place in, in our bar uh, by a racist guy who comes from now and start calling her name. So those are little things I'm saying. I don't know which one I would say is one. No, I'm sure that there are many, many events, but uh, thank you for sharing uh, a couple of them. And I would be curious because I know that people have a lot of questions and we're going to open up for a Q&A in just in a moment. Uh, but I would be love to hear from you if you want to share one sentence or two on something that you feel is very inspiring and something that gives you hope 
as it relates to the, our work on anti-racism? If you want to name one thing that you see is going out, uh, going on out there, uh, someone else's work, something else um, that gives you hope and inspiration as it relates to anti-racism. Uh, that is like the first part. And then I also want you to say something about where you're headed or perhaps something that helps you to slow down um, and reflect on that as well, like where you are at the moment. And Alfred, would you like to go first? I'm not sure, but what comes to mind is what shared with one of the students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology today. I learn as much from you as I as an elder would share with you and that you learn from me. Mm. I see that every time we talk, we take time in silence to listen, listen to each other, really try to hear what that other person is saying and how can that influence me and change my heart and my vision? And so that's all I'll say. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to go next? Yes, I will. Um, there are my hopes uh, for, uh, for the work that we are doing. I have, uh, I would say, two, I would mention two things that I'm seeing hopeful right now. Is the, one of them is the fact that it's more open discussion and talk about racism in the last few years, I would say probably in the last five years or so. Uh, uh, for example, anti-black racism was kind of um, brought out more following the death of George Floyd and the rise of Black, black Lives Matter. And uh, then there is also more institutions are willing to do something about it, mm -hmm. whether it's whether it's uh, just to uh, white to whitewash it, and I'm not using whitewash like white people like do a whitewash imagery, like kind of, <laughs> if whether they want to do that one or not. But I take that one as a positive, including our United United Church that has uh, set now the, the 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 desk that Adele is 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 holding right now. I see those one as a lot of um, good hopes. Struggles, I see an, a few struggles that we need to do more, uh, things that I find more challenging these days. The internet, the internet has become more of a breeding uh, ground for uh, racism. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, I'm finding that one quite, quite challenging, something that was not there actually uh, 15 years ago, if I would say. And so it's really changed, and, and especially with the, with the newer version of social media that has tweets or little Facebook comments or, or, or Instagram. So there's a lot of that, especially the anonymous yeah. writers uh, fighting that one quite troubling. I don't know how we can fight it. And especially when the rich racist people can buy things like Twitter and, and say we are open now for all racists. And you know what I'm, what I'm, talk, what I'm talking about, yeah? Twitter? Yes. So, so immediately uh, he bought it. I don't want to mention his name. That day, it'd be, all the racists came back and tweeted all the racist stuff they want. So I'm fighting that one as a lot of challenge. And of course, following that the rise of our populist white supremacist leaders all over the uh, the western world yeah uh, and uh it's, it's, you have seen this one in the united states and i don't know exactly the results of united states elections today how they will be and the impact they will have again in the next four four five years mm -hmm. will they bring us back donald trump Mm -hmm. who has become like the, the patron of that white supremacist uh, populist leaders. I don't know, but we are seeing the rise of that. And even in Canada, we are seeing that uh, coming back again. Um, I call them whiplashes. I hope they will not be long. I hope we can kind of bring down the monster before it comes back to life. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Wong, would you like yes. to share? Yeah, thank Something you. Something around where you see hope and yeah, that's where you're at. Okay. 
uh, briefly, uh, I find hope from the works on anti-racism today and the people who are interested in this topic. You are the hopes, I guess. We are the hopes, mm -hmm. right? And I joined in the fifth an intercultural adventure in Edmonton in October. And we were so glad and happy to see that there were more non-Korean participants who were aware of the importance of anti-racism. So, and I would probably be joining in co-authoring a book on the Holy Spirit for Koreans in the United States of Canada soon. And in addition, I believe that expanding the base of those who are interested in anti-racism and establishing a solidarity of those who, those people would make our way toward anti-racism. And well, in practical regard, uh, well, I'm trying to put my idea into practice. I mean, just whenever I go to visiting, go visiting or meet people, I'm trying to have intercultural meal together. I mean, no exclusion, no alienation, no discrimination, right? At table, right? It's very important. So, uh, well, in my congregation, most people are white, mm. European people, right? I'm the only Korean, my family only Korean. They are so interested in my life, right? Course, so, yeah. you know, when they come to my house, we serve meal with kimchi. I love kimchi. <laughs> yeah, and some of them love it. Yeah, and I'm enjoying their food too, right? Sharing food would be the best way of creating solidarity among people. Yeah, so just I'm doing, struggling with the issue in two ways, in theology and in practical ways. I think that's great to hear uh, your how you're carrying this out right now with breaking down barriers by sharing meals and invite people to your home oh, yeah, and sure. doing these things together. And it really ties so well also into what uh, Alfred has spoken so much about, about um, sharing stories you as well, Andrew, about the importance of communicating and, and speaking and being vulnerable and bringing our whole selves uh, to every conversation. Um, Adele has kindly uh, offered up the uh, code again in the chat, but I'm sure that there's a lot of questions. And if you want to write them down in the chat, you can do that. Uh, perhaps some, we don't have that much time left. I had so many more questions, but you were so <laughs> chatty. <laughs> and, but it was amazing listening and insightful and inspiring. Can, is there any questions here? Like people are saying a lot of thank yous. That's great. Let me just go back to see if I've missed uh, some specific questions. Um, there's been a lot of reflections. Let's see if there's any specific questions to one of you. Or if you feel like um, putting up your hand, you can do that too. Great reflections here. Not a lot of questions though. <laughs> okay, well, unless there's any questions from this group of Susan Finlay raised her hand, it says. So Susan, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Susan, you can feel free. Feel free to speak, Susan. Or do I have to unmute you somehow? Adele, do you want to see? No. Go ahead, Susan. We're listening.
Okay. Diane, I saw that you muted yourself and then unmuted yourself, and then muted yourself again. Perhaps you changed, had a change of heart, that's okay. Diane is being very kind. She says that I had good questions. <laughs> well, here, Song, what would you like to say to the United Church on moving forward in meaningful, helpful ways to becoming an anti-racist church? Thank you so much, Lynn, for asking that question. Excellent question. Uh, I noticed that Wong, you have uh, unmuted yourself, and so does Alfred. Wong, do you want to start? Uh, okay. Well, uh, there are two questions. Uh, yeah, actually, in that book, in the book, Jesus and the Marginalized, actually, uh, Don and I work together on how to uh, let people more engaged in uh, this issue and this movement toward the uh, inter, uh, just you know, overcoming racism and uh, becoming an intercultural church. And there, uh, we just you know, uh, talk about this issue like this. Just, uh, let me just you know, introduce. Uh, well, especially uh, white members, right? Uh, they uh, or the contributions that they can make to mm -hmm. overcoming. Uh, racism in the United Church of Canada, right? So and anyhow, the United Church needs to have racialized peoples together uh, for mutual support and community building and particip participation of racialized groups in the decision-making process of the United Church of Canada needs to be guaranteed. And we argued, but uh, their presence may be easily ignored. So for the two ideas to be realized, we encourage, you know, in the book, the white members of the United Church to recognize first the presence of the racialized peoples and to accept them as full members, mm -hmm. to listen to them, to cooperate with them, and for collaboration. Uh, well, the dominant white members might need exercise a free and creative self withdrawal in pursuit of mutuality. Mm. Uh, would be more like a practical idea, Sony, but uh, would be a helpful guide, guidance uh, when we think about how to become an intercultural church and overcome overcoming the racism. Thank you. Alfred, do you have any things that you would like to, you wanna try to answer that? I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think Part of what really helped us as indigenous people was uh, that we were given funding to meet across the country as indigenous people to give direction to the church. And that helped form the All Native Circle Conference. It helped us form the Francis Sandy Soto Center for training and ministry. Uh, it's still undergoing changes again because the structure of the United Church has changed. We're getting smaller, we're having to struggle. Um, but I think if can get together and talk. Uh, I think, as Owang said, we need to find ways, but we need to find ways by having everybody participate where we can and, and share with each other the insights that we've gained and find which direction do we go forward with as a group of people, not just one group of people. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to offer some reflections as well? Yes, I will. Um, you ask what I can do as a white person to work. There's a question uh, uh, there. Yeah, I'm thinking more, we're still on Lynn's question. I saw the other one as well, but what would you like to say to the United Church <clears throat> moving forward in meaningful, helpful ways to becoming an anti-racist church? What, uh, what I would say really, uh, I would connect with the last, uh, to the second to the last yes. question. Yes, yeah. what can we as white parishioners do to assist in continuing these discussions? They so really one of, in hand. One of them, one thing I would say to the United Church is um, 
uh, we are we began the discussion. Best not be contented on that on the beginning. The, it's the ending that matters. Because um, the beginning, everybody can begin. Anybody can begin a marathon. Anybody. Uh, but the ending is the one that matters. So really, it's to say, what we began, let's keep on doing it. Where we need to accelerate, let's push the gas, the, the gas pendle. Let's put more, more, more power. Where we need just to take a break and reflect on what we've done, it's also need, needed to be done. Take time to reflect for the United Church. As an individual within the, the United Church, do your part. If you are a, a, a white person, read. I would encourage you to read books like this. Come to seminars and workshops like this. That's what makes you a better person. Ask questions. Let's have what Paul Warfare uh, uh, talked about, awkward conversation sometimes. Mm-hmm. Let's have those awkward conversation. As a minister, one of the challenges I find in the white dominated churches that I minister to is, uh, is the white silence. Uh, for example, do and it's almost very discouraging. I would do a, a worship on uh, during the Black History Month, for example, or Sunday before or after Emancipation Sunday. And when I preach, nobody says anything. Mm. Yeah, nobody would say. I would not say that was a good yeah. someone like they usually say yeah. the other Sundays. And then like silence. Yes, and then silence. So you're like, why? And so usually yeah. I, I'm left with more questions and the people I wanted to ask me questions. So, mm. so, so I would say, it's better you ask me that open question and, and, and easy and easy as it is than not talking about it. Because I tend to believe probably um, my Christians will talk about it in the dining tables. Why don't we talk about it in the church? And I mean, ask me. I'm not even don't have the right answer. We will just explore together. We journey together. We conspire together. If I would go back to that terminology again, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Andrew and Susan. She says that she has uh, questions. I can't write it down. It's not simple. So Susan, do you want to try again to unmute yourself? I saw that you were successful, but then we didn't hear you. Do you want to try again? You're unmuted. So try to speak now. I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. Oh, that's too bad, Susan. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there's something going on. I'm so sorry. Adele also uh, made a shout out to a very uh, recent event on anti-racism for white people where there was a lot of ideas. So she just posted that as well. And, um, Let's see, I think Gary posted. Yes, he says, I hesitate to ask this because I am not sure whether I'll phrase it properly, but here it goes. In some seminars on this topic, it has been expressly stated that only white persons can be racist. Do you think this is true? And I'll pass the question first to Andrew. Now you're muted, Andrew. (laughs) <laughs> look at me yes i muted myself uh, thank you for reminding me that so i, I will answer that question in uh, two levels <clears throat> uh, the question is uh, the, is it only the white people can be racist um, in some of what we do in our anti-racist well, uh, i mean a racial justice workshop actually we kind of build on that premise and uh, and they'll probably be even better to answer this question but i'll, I'll try to answer today if you don't get it right she will help me here uh, i will do i will do this in the context we talk about dominant culture dominant culture so which is the dominant culture in north america which is the dominant racial formation in, 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 in North America. And remembering that racism itself is a social contrast, contra, contract, uh, what do you call it? Uh, social contract. Construct. Yes. Construct. Yes. Remember, English is not my language, actually. It's the oh, language. Me <laughs> Together. <laughs> social construct yes. that has taken 
uh, and especially white racism, uh, white supremacy has taken four to five centuries to build. So in that case then, whiteness become a system. And in that way, because it's taken since, especially the time of just, uh, when doctrine of discovery became the main thing, when the white Europeans goes to the rest of the world discovering. So what they, what, they, what they spread to the rest of the world is that we are superior, you are not. We discover you, we name you, we define what you want. We give you a language like the one I'm speaking, I'm speaking through. So in that way, then whiteness become a system that has to be deconstructed. Remember it's construct, deconstruct. It has, it has to be deconstructed. So in that way then whiteness become the symbol of, of racism in the present, present modern world for the last four, 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 five hundred years since our people were enslaved for 400 years. So that's how long it took to build that, that racism. But with a caveat here, it can happen in another dominant cultures. Let's say, for example, I'm, I'm in China. I'm using this one specifically because it has been noted that actually Africans also suffer a lot in China. So Chinese being the dominant culture, then become, they then become racist to African people. Get how it's working. So the dominant uh, 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 ideology can take that route too. But in North America, then we can only say it's only white people can be racist. But we can be prejudiced. A Korean or a, an African be prejudiced against each other. Those are prejudices, not racism. Okay. That's how we define it. Thank you. Uh, Wong and Alfred, and as you answer this, also sort of a last comment and reflection and only 20 seconds because we have so little time left. <laughs> if you can be brief, that would be great. Oh, uh, my turn? Yes, oh yes, Wong uh, and okay. Alfred. I mean, to the question, my answer, well, it depends upon how to define the word racist, right? And well, uh, very difficult to give on one answer before to this question in my sense, right? Yeah, uh, just my personal right, okay? And yeah, just in conclusion, uh, let us go together for this goal. Yeah, we all just, you know, are supporting anti-racism. Thank you. I just want to say that both Andrew and Wang spoke much better than I could speak. So oh, kudos oh. to them. <laughs> well, um, we're at 8.30 here in Toronto and 5.29 over. I can see your, your clock there behind you, Alfred. I would <laughs> see. <laughs> And I, I just wanted to say thank you for participating. And it's been an absolute delight for me to have a conversation with the three of you uh, today. Thank you for sharing insights, uh, hope, uh, things that is frustrating and moments of um, turning points, if you will. Thank you. Deep gratitude from me. And thank you all for you who have tuned in this evening and who have participated and who've been able to uh, reflect uh, together as a group. Thank you. Over you yes. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, there's just a few things that have been added to the chat. One about, um, in case you're interested in the full stories around the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, there's several that explore the concepts of whiteness or anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Asian racism, anti-Black racism, and more, lots of ideas for action and what does this actually mean practically for communities of faith. So uh, the link is there in case you wanted to explore any, any of those stories, as well as a link in case you wanted to sign up for the newsletter. There's a weekly newsletter that offers updates about what's happening um, and what you can expect. So uh, thanks again for being here this evening. Thanks especially to um, Alf, to Owan, to Andrew and Rebecca for engaging us in conversation today. Um, and all, for all of the work you've done before, your written work and for the ways you continue to engage in anti-racism. So thank you all. And I hope you have a good evening. Take care, bye-bye.